Hey guys, this is Cass from Elevate Your Craft and welcome to episode number four. This is a subject that I'm particularly interested in myself and I'm very fortunate to have Chris Kular here today with me. Thanks very much, Chris, for being here. Hey, Cass, thanks for having me. I'm excited as well. Yeah, no problem at all. I'm very fortunate. Again, I appreciate it. Uh, for the listeners, just a couple different things. We'll uh, get into many different subjects, but they'll all kind of be under the umbrella of education. You know, we'll talk a bit about students, um, universities, what it takes to be a professor, and all those kinds of things, and then hopefully uh, get into a bit of industry-specific when it comes to print. So, Chris, why don't you tell everyone a bit about what you're doing currently, and uh, we'll go from there. All right. Currently, I'm, I'm a professor at Ryerson University, and I've been teaching there for... 15 years full-time and approximately 10 years of part-time before I was hired for full-time. And uh, I enjoy working in the industry from, uh, from an education and from a practical perspective. And I try and use as much of my practical expertise to link the theory with the actual practice and industry. Currently taking a number of courses related to packaging and the packaging process because I feel that's the next generation of cool things in the industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what you're doing now. How did it all start for you? And this is a question that I like to ask all of the guests and many people in just regular conversation. But with education, was it a certain time or point where you knew this is where I'm going to go? Or was it kind of a gradual process where you kind of said, okay, I'm kind of slipping into this, I'm going to go with it? Well, I, I guess it, uh, it evolved from my industry experience years ago where I was an estimated production planner and every new person who was hired got the opportunity to sit with me for at least a week and I would go through the process of helping them understand what we did. And that education process led me to uh, be interested in, in teaching at Ryerson and, and uh, applying my skills and expertise to a, to a group of students. Mm -hmm. So it just evolved from uh, actually working in practice and then getting the opportunity to do that. Uh, back in, in 1990, a gentleman by the name of Ross Roy from Bound of Toronto came to Ryerson looking for an instructor who would be willing to teach courses to Bound employees on site. So I jumped at that opportunity and I worked with Bound exclusively for about two years, uh, teaching a variety of courses in Toronto and in Vancouver. Out in Vancouver, I was there for three months a year for two years, teaching courses, and from that point, I got the idea to start my own company for education and training. So mm -hmm. that just sort of evolved from working with Bound of Toronto, and uh, it moved on to bigger and better things. Mm -hmm. Now, aside from the kind of industry-specific, was there anything about education from kind of in the dealing with people or, or working with other people standpoint that you really enjoyed or did that just kind of come naturally? Well, it, it sort of came from myself learning from professionals and I was fortunate to have a number of great mentors as I was working in the industry and I, I enjoyed learning new things. So I thought if I could pass that on, it would be enjoyable for that person. And I tried to think of ways to make it easy for people to learn new things. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what inspires me on a daily basis. How important do you think a mentor is? I mean, I myself, I didn't really have one in terms of education, you know, going through school or, you know, no matter what level. But I, I probably say that my brother was my mentor. Yeah. But from your perspective, what, what would you say is very important about having one? I, I think having a, a mentor can uh, inspire people to look for ways of uh, enhancing their career opportunities. A, a good mentor can really open the eyes of people to, to be creative. I think that's a key thing is to being creative in the uh, graphic arts and printing industries. And if you can inspire somebody to be creative, I think that becomes very rewarding for yourself as well as the students. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, re very rewarding for me. In your experience, you kind of had one, or I don't know if you still have one, but is there sort of a, a transition point where you go from having a mentor yourself to being a mentor for others. Like, do you try to be mentors to your students? I try and model uh, professional behavior and show people the 
the uh, aspects of the industry that are rewarding and the interesting parts of the of the printing process is getting in touch with consumers. And I always enjoyed seeing things that were printed before they hit the market. So being a mentor is showing enthusiasm for a subject or a mm -hmm. topic or things that you talk about. It makes your life easier and more fun and it's also interesting from the student's perspective. Yeah, because yeah, I know from experience you being uh, a former professor of mine, you had a great ability to relate to students. And you know there was never a point where you kind of felt hesitant to approach you or, or ask any questions. In contrast, there were other professors who weren't, um, you know, so approachable or anything like that. What do you think it is? I don't know if this is intentional or if um, you kind of just do it naturally, but what do you think it is about that uh, or personality traits with yourself that allows for that? I think it make it opens the the doors to communication, and if you can if you can uh, convey that to somebody, if you're approachable, then it builds their skills and expertise as well, because they see that it's easy to talk about things, mm -hmm. and and if you can have that mindset from a student's perspective, it makes it easier for people to work in teams, and I mm -hmm. think that's a a thing about being approachable. That's a that's a key characteristic is uh, someone being able to talk to you. Yeah, yeah. and that's funny you mentioned teams because. I don't I didn't really see it until probably a year or two ago, but the value of how much GCM really made you work in a team. Right. And uh, that was sort of, you know, intentional, I imagine, to work in groups and that type of thing. But having that uh, communication is, is very important. And I've, like I said, I didn't see it until a couple of years ago, but I'm very grateful for it. Yeah. And I'm glad that it was something that you really yeah. Yeah. <laughs> portray <laughs> yeah, with yeah. your teaching. Sure. Now, you mentioned your mentors previously. Do you still keep in contact with them? Do you still see them as your mentors? Or? Well, I, I see uh, a few people from industry on a regular basis. And some people uh, I remember from the past. And, and uh, my father was the greatest mentor ever, being able to inspire me and my brother and I from when we were very young were always inspired by my father's eagerness and interest and his overall attitude of having a rewarding career. Mm -hmm. And that, that became a, a mentorship sort of role for my brother and, and my father. And uh, we sort of worked together and we always enjoyed it. So having mm -hmm. a, a decent mentor makes things more enjoyable because they, they can also show you the fun part and the rewarding part yeah. about, be, yeah. about doing anything is having a good mentor. For sure. Yeah. And, uh, you know, some of those philosophies, I guess, that you learned from your father or your mentors, uh, do you have any specific philosophies that you adhere to now? I mean, is there anything where you consciously, you know, wrote it down, you said, this is what I'm going to implement into my teaching, uh, this is what I really want to convey uh, to my students, uh, etc.? Um, well, as far as philosophies, uh, uh, the key one is to demonstrate respect for the students and their desire to acquire new knowledge. And if mm -hmm. you respect the students, the rest of the learning and teaching process starts to become more natural. But it, it does come from the instructor showing respect for the students. And the idea there is to, is to demonstrate that respect and to show that you are a professional and that you do have something of value to add to their learning. Mm -hmm. And that's a key thing is just demonstrating respect for the students right from the right from day one. Yeah. Have you yeah. ever had any students kind of come back to you and say, well, you know, I really appreciate your, your teaching method or you're kind of a great person or I really like the way or your style that you teach? Yeah, I, I don't talk about that much, but every year, <laughs> every year there's, a, there's a handful of students that I know from their genuine comments that have made a difference in their uh, in their eagerness to pursue a career. And mm -hmm. it's little things that, that add up to decisions that they pursue. So if I can add value to the student's experience, that's my goal, is to make it enjoyable for them. Yeah. yeah. Do you think that's a little more difficult in a larger program? Because I know specific to GCM, it's, it's fairly small. Uh, I know yeah. you mentioned that it was maybe 180 at, at the students at this point. Yeah. But do you think a lot of the success you've had in relating to the students is due to that? I think uh, the, the way you get closer to a, a student in terms of the educational experience is, is in smaller lab sizes, working with groups and smaller teams. And I think you get to know the students uh, quite a bit through those experiences, having uh, group assignments and dealing with them more one-on-one -on -one in lab work. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and I, you probably deal with them more on a mature level too, uh, and that kind of segues nicely into, 
you know, the different education levels, you being a university right. professor, then you also have elementary school teachers, you have high school teachers. Yeah. What challenges do you think that you would face that, you know, elementary or high school teachers might not necessarily face? Well, the, the, the key thing about the university level is that the students are choosing to be there and they're paying to be there and they expect uh, an excellent high level of education. So there is a difference between the high school and the elementary school levels in terms of you're closer to the point where somebody decides on their career. Mm -hmm. and I think that's a key part there is that you're playing a significant role at a transition point where they're going to pursue it may be one, two, maybe 20, 30 years of their life. So it's a key role there, and it's important to stay in touch with what the students' expectations are. Yeah, yeah. And that's, I'm glad you brought that up because as far as student expectations and what you've seen from students, how would you compare them now to, say, 10, 15 years ago? Yeah, there has been quite a bit of a change there, and a lot of it has to do with, uh, I guess, Steve Jobs and Apple and social media, and the students are so tech savvy today and they're so engaged with social media that you really have to blend the learning and education to to help the students understand how that education can be utilized or applied in a social situation as well as a professional situation mm -hmm. so i find in general the students are are more tech savvy and they're very clever at utilizing new technologies in ways that i hadn't thought of in the past so it's a lot of social media stuff it's a lot of, uh, I call them clever phones instead of smartphones, just yeah. to be a little bit different. But um, I think that the students are, are uh, more eager to learn the high tech stuff. And mm -hmm. they're not just, uh, you know, ink on paper in terms of the print media stuff. They, they're interested in being creative and how they can use those creative skills in a, in a real world situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's actually key because... You know, the the standard classroom that you see now, it kind of moved away from that model of, you know, you have your classroom, you have your desk, yeah. you're quiet the whole time, yeah. the bell goes off, and then it was kind of more of that factory-oriented yes. yeah, yeah. lifestyle sure. where now you mentioned that students want to be more creative. They want to be engaged, I think, in different ways. And Yeah. Yeah. Have you... Have you made changes to your specific, you know, to your limits, how much you can change the curriculum or your approach to the course? Yeah, yeah that, that's a good part there, Matt. I mean, uh, about five years ago, I had the opportunity to teach in Europe for six months, and that really opened my eyes because of the diversity of the students and their backgrounds and the different levels of interest that, that they showed uh, even within my class. And I really had to rethink my teaching styles to be appealing to a wider background of students. Mm -hmm. And that, that opened my eyes. And that was uh, a real key transition point for me about five years ago when I had the opportunity to teach in Europe. And that was, that was uh, an excellent uh, opportunity. It was very rewarding. So it was, it was a key point right yeah. there. Yeah. What were your uh, teaching experiences like when you first started? I mean, as compared to now, you know, you mentioned technology, yeah. but aside from that, even just within yourself, you're a new professor, yeah. you're kind of learning the, the craft. You, if you look back now in hindsight, always 2020 kind of thing, yeah. how would you kind of perceive yourself then? The, the, the key difference there is that when I first started teaching, you were expected to be very rigid with a curriculum. You couldn't sway from it. You had to teach these topics in this order and you couldn't really uh, bring in too many outside ideas to enhance the curriculum because somebody was always evaluating how close you came to presenting the curriculum the way it was in the course outline. Mm -hmm. And with the, the changes in, in my perspective for education to be more creative is to bring in more outside ideas to help the students understand that it goes beyond just what it says in the course outline. Yeah. So yeah. that's been a, a key change there as well. What I'm sure has kind of stayed maybe the same uh, is what you see in the students. Right. Because, you know, you see a lot of different students out there. And, you know, like anything, there are some that are passionate. You know, they, they like to do the work, but there are others who aren't so passionate. Are there key kind of attributes that you could that you see in students where you think, you know what, they're probably going to do well in the future. Yes. 
And it, it actually goes back to something we sort of just talked about is approachability. Mm -hmm. And you can tell which students are approachable and which ones are eager to to learn about the subject matter. And there's students who show up early and there's students that, that stay a couple minutes extra at the end. And those are the students who tend to ask more engaging questions. And you can tell by their questions whether or not they're interested in the subject matter and whether they're interested at uh, elevating their education to learn new things that goes beyond the strict curriculum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think that outside of the curriculum there should be things that uh you know, should implement into a, a curriculum, whether it's, because I mean, from my perspective, you know, you're getting the education relating to the industry, in this case, GCM, um, but any program, when you look at things that are so important from a career perspective, like networking, you know, like even the psychological aspects of it, dealing with workplace stresses, new things, uh, dealing with people who aren't so friendly, for example. Yeah. Do you think there are things out there that should be implemented into uh, the university level curriculum? Yeah, I, I do agree that uh, the university should go beyond the curriculum to perhaps bring in some professionals who are currently working in the industry, not only the seasoned veterans, but students who are working in the industry for maybe one or two years, so that they can come back and reflect on what they saw in terms of changes after they graduated from university. Mm -hmm. So I think having a, a link to the real world is of interest to a lot of students because they're wondering what's going to happen beyond their education. And if you can have some solid testimonials from, from people who have lived the experience and people who are positive and enthusiastic about their choice of career, students can relate to that and yeah. they can sort of link their own desires to perhaps what someone else has said from the real world perspective yeah so okay. bringing that in is quite i really important. like that yeah. idea is that something that's done now or you know student graduates ever brought in or is that available in as certain instructors will uh, have connections with the industry and they will be able to bring their personal friends in or or professional contacts from industry when there's a subject that links directly to that person's expertise. And I find that people who are enthused about their careers are happy to come in and share their knowledge with students. And I find it's a great mm -hmm. learning experience and I've had great success from doing that. Yeah. It's yeah. been quite good. Huh. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's kind of more on the a micro level of bringing in, you know, a student from industry or a graduate. But if you look on the sort of a larger scale, and I don't know if you've had any interaction with professors at, at Ryerson or wherever that have dealt with much larger classrooms, you know, and they have to connect now with 500 uh, people instead. Yeah. And this will kind of segue nicely into the challenges into each or with universities in general. Right. First, I don't know if you can provide any, any insight on, you know, how do you connect with a large group of students? And then we'll get into just kind of the university in general and what challenges you see. Yeah, indeed. That, that is a challenge. But the thing that, that brings me confidence is being prepared. Mm -hmm. And if you're prepared and you're bringing something of value to the students and you're able to present that information in a confident manner, the students begin to see that, hey, I'm here for a reason and this person's got something of value and they pay attention and they become more engaged regardless of the size of the class. I find that if the instructor's prepared and they're enthusiastic about a topic, it makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's an interesting challenge for kind of the larger, the groups, but more on a university level, do you ever feel limited in what you can do um, in terms of, because let's face it, I mean, university is a business. Right. So they have to approach it that way. Do you right. ever kind of feel that you're limited in how you want to approach, you, whether it's your curriculum, your teaching style, or there's ever things that are kind of getting in the way of what the ideal would be for students right. or professors? Okay. In those situations, Matt, what I like to do is create uh, projects and assignments that allows the students to be creative and also go beyond the curriculum. And by doing that, it opens their eyes to other possibilities. So the whole idea of creating a, a larger assignment that goes beyond the curriculum gives the students their own choice as to a certain subject or topic that they want to pursue. So mm -hmm. I think that's a key there, is giving people choice and making it interesting to learn new things. Mm -hmm. So I, you mentioned uh, previously about preparation. Yeah. How do you prepare for whether it's a specific lecture or even on a larger scale, 
um, a semester. Yes. You know, once you're, you kind of have your curriculum, what do you do to prepare for it? Yes. I think the, the research into the topic and making sure that the, the sequence of topics makes sense. And through the semester, the idea is to build on the previous session that you've had so that at the end of the year, they've got a whole range of, of uh, skills and expertise that they've picked up through the semester. And one of the key things that I've done in the last couple of years is I've started to develop online education courses. Mm -hmm. So the first one that I developed was a course for estimating and production planning. And to do an online course, you have to have the entire course prepared prior to the first day. And that gives you a very good sense of urgency to make sure that everything is in order and make sure that the students will gain something with each session that you present. Mm -hmm. So developing online courses has also enhanced my ability to see the big picture so that I'm sure and I'm confident that the topics will flow together and they will mean something at the end. So do you mean online courses as complements to your lectures or your, your labs? These are separate courses. These oh, are separate okay. courses that I've developed. I've done three different courses now. There's two courses that are completely online and one course that I developed two years ago is a hybrid course where students come in for two Saturdays at six hours each Saturday and the rest of the course is online. So it's a hybrid course that oh, gives wow. me connections with the students as well as the online component. And I'm finding that the students love the online component because of the flexibility yeah, and, yeah. and uh, the ease of taking those courses from any location. There was one student I had in my class last year, and uh, she lives in Sioux Lookout, Ontario, and she took the estimating production planning course online, and she was so happy that she had the opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. And it was from, from that distance. That's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. So is it are the courses to kind of learn things that are outside of your courses, or just kind of, are they, like you said, they're hybrid, but yeah. is it to, based on the content in your courses, or this is something completely separate? This is based on the content in the courses, okay. but it gives them more flexibility to do their own research because they're not see, confined yeah. to a certain amount of time, 50 minutes in a one hour lab or, or a, an mm -hmm. experiment uh, period that you've got. It allows them to, to go beyond the time constraints of a of a class. That's a great yeah, idea. Yeah. So you, it's, it's working quite well. Is this something you've developed kind of on your own? Do other professors do this? Or? It's, a, it's a big thing with a lot of universities that uh, they're taking the initiative to go beyond the boundaries of transportation to and from uh, a university. And so many universities around the world are, are initiating these distance learning modules to reach a broader audience and to create some flexibility into the learning process. Mm. I guess I mean, taking advantage of that technology totally that you mentioned. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that, that thing, you know, as you mentioned, what's different from 10 years ago, just a simple thing of online streaming and connecting mm -hmm. to the internet. 10 years ago, we didn't have that technology to make that live connection to do online streaming or have online chats or using uh, uh, different uh, forms of media to connect to a, a distance audience. So that certainly got a lot better. Yeah, I think it's really good to approach education in, in different ways too. And I don't know, from my experience, I didn't really figure this out until probably third year, but you know, students learn in different ways. Right. And one of the things I think that, you know, at least the older kind of system of education lacked was approaching top topics from not only a visual standpoint, yeah. but from auditory from yeah. being able to touch and feel. Right. You know, some people need to actually touch things and, and yes. build them and see how they work. Sure. You know, for instance, a press. Yes. Um, others can actually just look at something. And then others were, me, for instance, I started recording lectures. Right. And then I would just play them and listen to them. Yes. And that's kind of how I really found I learned the best. Right. And I don't know if you've found or implemented into your um, curriculum or your style over the years, if you've found that or in agree, and um, if you've kind of approached your educating in an auditory, visual, or, you know, the whole package, right. per se. Yeah. I think it's, it's become, uh, there's more tools available now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when I was developing the hybrid course, I found that there's so many wonderful resources with YouTube clips, and that's yeah. changed the entire learning process, where it's difficult to demonstrate something online if the person is, is not in front of you. So having a YouTube clip to blend in with the theory that you're, that you're presenting to the students really helps them understand what happens in the real world. And there's quite a few 
uh, vendors and suppliers who are more than happy to post their uh, their uh, offerings online mm -hmm. to show students how they work. And I find that's been a great asset to developing these online courses is being able to link uh, YouTube clips to the yeah. subject matter that you're teaching. I think you pretty much have yeah. to have that now, Definitely. whether you're in education, uh, a business, or kind of the online or social media aspect yeah. of yeah. it. So going back to just being a professor, right? You know, what does it it take? You know, if you, if you saw someone that was looking to become a professor, and you could say, you know, these are the three most important things I can offer you right now what would they be? Well, my key thing is to be able to link the theory with the practice. So it's great if a, an educator, instructor, professor has industry experience where they can mm -hmm. see how the theory works and they know how it can be applied in the real world. So in terms of that, it's, it's great to have that as an asset and be able to share that knowledge and expertise with the students. Another key thing is to, to take the initiative to enroll into workshops and perhaps courses that add value to your own knowledge and expertise to keep you up to date with what's going on in the in the trends in the industry to be able to uh, link a new project to uh, something that students can learn and perhaps to get them involved with uh, self-directed learning to show that they can be creative on their own and link their ideas with a project that an instructor assigns. Mm -hmm. um, so those things are key and also learning about social media. When I talk to professionals in the industry and they tell me about their clients, these are print brokers and project managers, they all tell me about how important it is to, to link a social media content uh, part to, to all jobs that are printed. They need things that are online, they need the ink on paper, but there's also the social media trends of being able to connect with a consumer through mm -hmm. social media and these clever phones are are ideal for that and the new formats there's you know the samsung and the sony and the apple they're larger formats and they're sort of le leaning in that direction to to get people more engaged with their clever phones yeah yeah i'm sure you see a lot of clever phones Indeed, in the yeah. classrooms they, everybody's got it and, and they all use it it's just it's part of the way things are yeah, yeah. i mean it's so i remember it probably started i would think well fourth year for me anyway yeah. where it was probably did more harm yeah. Then good. Uh, but you probably just learn to zone those kinds of things out and uh, just keep marching on with, with your with your lecture. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's the part of it being prepared. You've got to pre be prepared for that and mm -hmm. be able to uh, avoid those distractions and, and also accept the distractions because they're going to be there and you don't want to disrupt your own flow because you're looking around to see who's texting, texting somebody else because it's, it's going to happen. They are engaged and, and you just have to deal with it. You just have to move forward and make it interesting to learn new things. Yeah, I guess that's kind of how do you deal with that? I mean, because if you're up there and you see this classroom and you just know that yeah. they're not really engaged. Is that something that you would take personally and say, listen, I'm not, I'm doing something wrong here. You know, my content isn't good enough yeah. or I need to restructure things so I can get their attention. Or do you kind of just say, ah, these students are useless. No, I'm you know, not. they don't want to learn, you know, but I'm sure there are many that would yes. uh, take that approach, but I don't foresee that you would. So yeah. how do you deal with that? Well, I, I'll tell you, I've got, I've got, um, a different perspective on that. I don't use PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. I don't use PowerPoint slides, and I know so many instructors uh, who who simply make those slides available for students. And all it takes is a group of two or three students to, to take turns as to who's going to make the notes on the slides. So I don't use PowerPoint. In my lectures, I prepare the main topics of the lecture, and I present the material in a sequential flow, which. Um, sort of prompts them to be engaged, to pay attention, to take their own notes. Mm -hmm. So I do prepare the, the main topics in every lecture and uh, I present it based on a, a logical flow of information. Once again, I'm prepared for the, for the class and I take the initiative to, to think about what's interesting for the students. Yeah, well that's, yeah. long term, that's the best way to go. Otherwise yeah. you probably just drive yourself nuts. It seems to be working. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, one thing that you definitely get in, in speaking uh, with you is that you're, you're passionate about the industry, right. you know, print and graphics. Yeah. What initially drew you to print and graphics and how, you know, starting in 2008, like many industries, it saw a huge hit. Yes. And I know for me, I started in 2008. It it seemed pretty grim uh, for a while. And now it's, it's really um, quite good. You know, things are looking up. 
um, which you know every industry saw. But how do you stay engaged within print, and you know what do you see uh, with it in the next you know five to ten years for yourself and the industry? Sure. Um, as I've mentioned, uh, my my key interest now is into packaging. And I've always been interested in, in seeing new packages in grocery stores, pharmaceutical stores, big box stores, electronic stores. And I'm finding that the, the creative skills of a professional designer make mm-hmm. all the difference in the world. Being able to design and create something with either graphics or colors or, or die cuts, foil stamping, embossing, something that's going to uh, be appealing to a consumer to make them reach for one product versus another product. Mm-hmm. So I'm all about packaging, and I think that that's where it's at. Just thinking, you know, I've, I've read recently that uh, in a Walmart, there's, there's 40,000 different products in a Walmart. And I'm just thinking everything's got a package. Everything's got printing on it. And I think it's, it's great to be able to connect with a consumer through printed communications. That's also linked, linked to digital communications. The branding thing. I'm seeing more and more branding uh, initiatives from people to, to help remember a brand. And mm-hmm. that's been a, a key change over the last couple of years is the importance of, of creating a brand image. Yeah. So well, I think a, a lot of doors have opened up too for for printers because there is always the kind of the battle. You know, you'd have the designer who designs something, but it can't be printed. Right. You know, then the printer has to go back to the designer and say, listen, this is kind of, yes. can, we can't do this. Yes. Um, so now I think with all the new technologies, especially digital, a lot of new doors have opened up right. uh, for designers. Yeah. Where do you see um, the industry going in that respect? You, like, what do businesses kind of have to do? Um, and you can link this back to Ryerson too, because of course you'll be educating the people that go into right. in the next five to ten years. Yes. But what do you see for them and uh, in the industry in terms of uh, the knowledge? How do you see your program changing? Well, I, I think the key is that you know the program's called Graphic Communications Management, and yet yet they don't teach graphics and there's no one on staff with any professional credentials in graphic design so i think that that if the students had the awareness and knowledge of the the importance of a skilled graphic designer they would be more in tune to be able to link those skills to what the printer is able to do in terms of reproducing images Mm -hmm. so i think the graphic design aspect is is often overlooked and i think there's huge opportunities to get students more involved with the creative process and understanding print media technologies, capabilities and limitations. So I think if, if, if both sides, graphic designers and print media people, uh, started getting closer together so that they could understand the capabilities and limitations of reproduction processes, and the graphic designers would, in, in turn, have a better idea as to where to go with their designs and, and to make it easier to do something. Mm-hmm. So that's a huge opportunity. But definitely. And on this subject, too, and this is kind of you know out of my curiosity because I love this subject so much, but I know you've taught sales as well. Right. And that's huge part uh, of the process as well yeah and there's kind of the saying you know everyone has to sell themselves everyone is always selling that that kind of idea right how do you i mean do you see it that way for just yourself being a professor do you kind of see it that you have to sell yourself to students um when you know discussing things with them when actually teaching them or just with interacting with them in general? Indeed. I, I think that that really adds to your credentials if you're able to connect with a student. And it, it all comes down to modeling that professional behavior and showing them that you do have skills and expertise in certain areas. When I talk about the selling course, I also call it selling and customer service mm-hmm. because you're not always a salesperson in front of a customer. You also do a lot with customer service. The key thing that I've seen in the industry over the last couple of years is that a lot of people can do a pretty good job of putting ink on paper and reproducing color images accurately. The key difference is in how the print media company deals with a customer and how easy are they making it for the customer to do business with them. Mm -hmm. And I use a slogan quite frequently and I call it solving problems and providing solutions, S&P, P&S. And I find that if you make it easy for somebody to do business with you, you'll have a better chance of avoiding competitive pressures. Yeah. So just yeah. getting in tune with the customer, making it easy to do business with them. Yeah. And that's what they're looking for. I'm glad you mentioned 
customer service because that's really what it comes down to. I mean, I know myself being in that, you know, the account manager and sales, there's a pretty bad perception generally around it. Yeah. And, you know, kind of that, even just the word selling yes. or to sell something to someone, to me, it has a slightly negative connotation. Right. But if you kind of reverse it and go into customer service, because that's really what it is, yes. um, it makes it a heck of a lot better. And, you know, when dealing with people, that kind of perception gets skewed. And I think that it's really important to bring that up because you can't, you have to be honest. You have to be a genuine person. You have to just be transparent. Right. And especially now with social media too, yes. saying that it's very important for businesses, you can't get away with anything right. like that anymore. That's it. Exactly. And at the yeah. essence of it, you have to be very transparent as you know, as a professor and even as a professional in the print industry. Indeed, yes, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, finally, we'll just talk about some kind of resources. Okay. Um, I always kind of like to ask this because, you know, for the listeners, um, I think books are a huge resource, yeah. websites, really anything that you can think of that has helped you throughout your career, right. um, whether it's just from general knowledge or just being a, a better professor in general. Indeed. I guess, uh, Matt, the, the one book that I found many years ago, it has since been updated, and the updated, uh, the new edition is excellent, and it's a, it's a book called Teaching Tips, and one of the author's names is Mikichi, and I found that using that book and applying my skills and expertise to the methods that are presented in this book, it's an excellent resource for being able to present something of value to a, a student. Mm -hmm. And in addition to presenting that, you also learn on your own. So I learn a lot from students. And that whole process of open communication and approachability, being prepared, I think is a, is a key aspect of uh, presenting knowledge and expertise to students. Mm -hmm. and, and that's been a great resource for me, is that book has got so many tips and techniques for making it easy to teach things and making it easy for students to learn those things. Do you encourage feedback from students? Because just thinking, I think that is such a valuable tool. Indeed, yeah. Because, um, you know, whether there's a formal pro process for it or, um, you know, like a comment or suggestion box, that right. kind of thing. Yeah. But I feel if you really kind of buckle down, you could learn a lot from like you said, the yeah, students. Sure. Is that something you encourage Feed or just yeah. take it kind of as it comes? No, feedback is wonderful because it allows you to, to understand what's working and to move forward to enhance that. Mm -hmm. It also allows you to find out what may not be working so that it'll give you information to, to modify or change your approach to make it easier to learn a, a subject. And there's been many times where somebody has asked a question where I thought, well, uh, I assume that they might have known that or I assume that I, that I was teaching that. But having them ask a question makes me reevaluate how I'm presenting a topic. So feedback is an excellent way to move forward and enhance and build your skills and expertise and make it even easier to learn new subject matter. Yeah. yeah. And this is one uh, aspect that definitely hits home for me is the questions you kind right. of just mentioned because... I know for myself in the past, and I'm sure it's a factor for a lot of students, is the, the hesitation to ask questions. Yeah. And I don't know if that's something you've acknowledged and you try to kind of say, listen, ask the questions. Yes. You know, there's no, uh, there's no reason not to. Don't be embarrassed because a lot of it is just ego kind of not wanting right. to be evaluated yeah, or yeah. thinking I'm an idiot for not knowing yes. that. I don't know, is there something that you can kind of offer to, to combat that or where you kind of say, all right, how can I approach these students kind of say, to just to encourage them to ask whatever they want? Well, I, I think it's, it's your own, uh, how you model that behavior, your own demeanor, your mm -hmm. own attitude. And if you, if you present something and you offer feedback that's in a way that, that builds on what they already know, it encourages them that they already know things but you're adding value to something. So feedback should always be to add value to what the person already has. Mm -hmm. And it's not just a formal thing by, by having to tell a student, hey, you can ask me any question, come see me anytime. It also comes from connecting with the students outside of class. If you see somebody in a lobby or in a hallway or in between classes, it's always nice to be able to engage with that person, a comment that has absolutely nothing to do with school mm -hmm. or education or a topic, just being 
being able to to talk to somebody makes it easy for them to to talk to you. It's yes. not always yeah. a professional, uh, regimented academia sort of thing. It's also social conversations as well that makes it easier for you to connect to a student and, and makes you more more approachable in, in their eyes. Definitely, yeah, actually, so. that was actually something I was going to say too. Yeah. You know, just being able to chat yes. outside of, you know, finish a class, chat in the hallway for a second, that right. kind of thing. It's exactly. the rapport Indeed. that you build with the students that uh, is a huge factor. Indeed. But. There's one thing that I use, uh, Matt, in in, uh, in many of my courses. Uh, instead of just waiting for the end of the year for the students to fill out forms uh, that the school puts out for critique and evaluating the instructor and subject matter, after every class, I ask a simple question about the some aspect of what was just presented and I and I lean that question to say what was the most valuable part of this part of the lecture and this is is part of the way that students say well okay this is what I learned and this is the feedback that I'm giving to the instructor so that so that I can take that information in and, and understand if I've made a connection with the students and so many times I've been so impressed with the comments and feedback from the students. I get, I often get more than what I expect from the students in, in terms of their comments of what they learned from something I presented. Yeah, well, so, it's, it's yeah. forcing them to look back. It is. On the lecture, right? right? And say, okay, kind of scanning and say, what did I really take from it? And even just that, something as small as that is very valuable. Indeed, it takes just a minute. And in my classes, I do that on a regular basis. I do it in every class so that when they come to the next class, they know there's gonna be a question that, that, that sort of encourages them to reflect on what they've just experienced and what mm -hmm. they've learned and, and perhaps give some of that feedback back to me so that I understand that they're getting it. And, yeah. and perhaps uh, another creative idea, I mean, students uh, often put things on there that, that open my eyes to what they're thinking and what they expect to learn and, and, mm -hmm. and their experience. Because a lot of students have experiences that that I've never had, and, and they share that. And if there's something key, something cool and interesting, I'll mention that in the next class. Yeah. And, yeah. and it gets them to, to know that their feedback matters yeah. and that I am reading it and it is of value to me. Do you create the, the question strategically? Is it kind of meant to lead them in a certain direction to say, you know, this is probably the most significant thing of the lecture, but kind of see what they say? That's, that's what I do. It's a yeah. key point, and it's something I know that everybody will have, uh, have their own opinion on. And it's uh, one of those things that, that, that makes them know how important that topic is. Yeah. 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 Huh. yeah. So I think this is a really good question to kind of end on. And throughout your career, what would you say has been the most rewarding aspect of being a professor? The most rewarding part is, is uh, seeing the eyes open up and seeing a student get the subject matter to be able to take that information and apply it to their own interests. And a lot of that has uh, comes from the creativity and being able to go beyond a course outline so that people can, can apply their own interests and their own desires to learn new things. That's, a, that's such a good point because even just looking at myself, if you don't understand that, it, it hopefully it happens somewhere down the line, yeah. but you use what you've gained to kind of push you in the direction of right. your own interests. Yeah, that's awesome. That is a really good yeah, point. I fantastic. Like that. <laughs> that's great. Very rewarding. Yeah, very, yeah. yeah definitely. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks, guys. That's it for today. Um, if you like the stream, you could uh, follow me at Elevate Your Craft on Facebook or EYC Kazmanasty on uh, Twitter. Um, otherwise, we'll see you again soon. Thanks very much.